sometimes at, uh, at the Sanders household, when, we, uh, when we're not sure what we're going to do that evening, we try to find some show to watch. And so uh, we'll do what a lot, of, a lot of folks do nowadays, is uh, we'll go to Netflix and we'll try to see, well, what's on, it, on Netflix? And one of the shows that, we've, uh, that we started watching, and uh, at least that me and my wife have started watching, was, was Cobra Kai. Anybody, anybody watch Cobra Kai in here? Like nobody. Oh, okay. Yeah, we got a couple of folks. A couple of folks. Here's my section over here watching Cobra Kai. Of course, that's a, that's kind of a follow up to a movie from a long, long time ago, Karate Kid. Now, how many of y'all saw Karate Kid? Got a few more. Yeah, a few more people saw Karate Kid. Yeah, but just about everybody. Oh, wow. Well, uh, so you remember in Karate Kid there was uh, this famous scene. Of course, you know, uh, Russo started getting beat up and all that kind of stuff. So he goes to Miyagi and and uh, Miyagi takes him under his wing and and um, and when he comes in for training. What is it that he tells him to do? I want you to come over here, I want you to wax the cars, and I want you to paint the fence, and, and uh, scrub the deck, and all this kind of stuff, all this crazy stuff. And, uh, and after a while, Russo's like, I, I, this makes no sense to me, I don't know why I'm doing this. And finally, he confronts him, and he's like, why? Why do you have me doing all this stuff? I'm here to, I'm here to train for karate. And so he, suddenly he teaches him, he, shows, he says, show me wax off. Show me wax off. And, you know, all of a sudden he's able to do all these moves because of the stuff that he was doing. And when it finally dawns on him why he's doing all these mundane projects, it really brings on a whole new meaning to what it is he is there to do. It really helps him to focus in then on actually learning karate and doing these, these mundane tasks. Because why really makes a difference when you approach something. The reason that you're doing it makes all the difference in the world. And really what I want to talk to you about today is why. I want to answer a why question that really nobody is asking, honestly. But I hope that you're going to be asking before I get finished. I want to talk with you about why I'm going to talk about what I'm talking about in the month of February. We're going to talk about heaven, our home. Heaven, our home. Now a lot of folks, that's a, that's a dear subject. Just to talk about that, even to, even to mention that, it, you don't really need any priming. You're like, yeah, man, let's, let's jump into that. But we live in a day and age where everything is about the here and now. How do I navigate through this particular problem? Or how do I, how do I handle what's going on at work? Or what is it that I do with my finances? How can I make that better? And how do I do with relationships and those kinds of things? And everything is about the, is about the here and now. And we are consumed with the here and now and I believe that we hurt the here and now because that's all we think about is the here and now. now I think we do ourselves a great favor a great service when we as believers at least when we as believers consider heaven and how that affects us here on the earth but we really don't have that line of thinking probably 95 percent of churches today are simply talking about how am I going to navigate through this life right here and right now. In fact, I, was, uh, I looked online and I, I found a, an interesting quote by a man named Ed Elliott. And here's what he said. He's got a lot of articles about a lot of different things having to do with, with scripture and, and, uh, and our spiritual lives and those kind of things. And listen to what he said. He said, so Jesus spoke about hell 3% of his messages and heaven 10%. I believe, he says, I believe that it makes, that makes it safe to say that the other 80, 87% of the time that Jesus spoke about, that he spoke, he spoke about life, relationships with God and people, and how to navigate this life in victory. I don't know about the math. I don't, I've never done that study. Does he really talk about hell 3% and heaven 10%? But I believe that this is a, a gross misunderstanding a misreading of those of those statistics if they're true even if they're not true it's a it's a gross misrepresentation of what god was thinking and saying and what jesus was thinking and saying as he spoke in fact i would turn it around and say this let's just say that it's true let's just say that only 10 percent of the time he talked about heaven i want you to think about that of all the subjects that he could have talked about one out of every 10 words that came out of his mouth was talking about heaven. That is no small amount. 
He wasn't just passing over the subject so he could get to something more important like how it is that you walk through this world. No, he, he spent a lot of time talking about heaven. I, I've, I've got a statement here, and I, I hope you've got one of these, uh, one of these um, uh, outlines, one of these growth guides on your way in, and, and that you'll, uh, you'll take this out and take, take down a few notes. Only 13 words I'm asking you to write down, and then you can write however many more on top of that that you want to. But this statement, I hope, will stick with you, not just for today, and not just for this series in the month of February, but I hope it will stick with you until you actually meet God face to face. Because here's the truth of the matter. For most people, even believers, even people who are, who are packing the pew this morning or who are watching online, spending uh, at least an hour of their time in the worship of our Creator, most people, for most people, heaven serves as a welcomed distraction. I mean, I'm going through it. I'm really, I'm really getting pounded by life. And there are all these things that are getting, getting uh, uh, piled on top of me. And I'm feeling this pressure in this area, in this area, in this area. So, man, it's just nice just to talk about heaven just so I can forget about it for a little bit. And that's really what heaven serves for them. But God meant for so much more. Heaven's not just a distraction as most people would have it. In, in fact, I, uh, I, 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 I also looked at Faith Gateway, and Faith Gateway, this, it says that Jesus mentioned heaven 70 times in the book of Matthew alone. It pointed out that, that heaven is spoken of in 54 out of 66 of the books in the Bible. It was mentioned in the very first verse of the Bible, and it's mentioned in the second to last chapter of the book of Revelation, and it's everywhere in between. It's meant to be more than just a distraction from all the difficulties of this life. No, it should serve as our primary direction. It's not just a distraction. Folks, heaven is our direction. Heaven is our home. I think about what Jesus said when it's there in your outline, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know what that means? He means That means you need to focus on heaven. It means you need to think about heaven. You need to live with heaven on your mind. And all of these things that you deal with and all these things that you want direction for, heaven is Heaven is what gives you the greatest mindset to deal with it all. So I want to give you, I guess what I would call, maybe a top ten list. In the spirit of the old Dave Letterman show, let me just give you a top ten list of why I hope you will engage with us over the next month, at least. A top ten list. Number one, the reason that we want to talk about heaven is simply to learn. I don't really know how else to say it, but just to learn. I brought this, uh, I, I brought these books up here to set them up here. Uh, and, uh, I got to thinking about last week when I brought all those Skittles up here, you know, we had the little contest guess, guess how many Skittles are in here and whoever got closest one. I, I got to thinking about this on the way up. I should have, I should have taken a picture of this and said, guess how many pages are on here. But I, I don't know that anybody really wants to win these books like they want to win Skittles. But anyway, I, I'm looking through these books and some of these these right here are, at least in, in my library, uh, which I, I've got a lot of books in my office, these are probably the, the primary theological books that I have. And, uh, and if, let me just open this one up and just look. This one has uh, 1,204 pages. All right, that's, that's some good night reading, right? For, at least for smart people it is. This one, uh, this one here, this is uh, a theology of the church. This one has 900 and 77 pages in this one. And then, of course, you can see, I mean, these are, these are some big, fat books, which for those of you who have been through my class, you know that one of the main things you want for your library at your home is big, fat books because they make you look smart. I mean, you walk in my office, I got those things, man, they make me look, it's the only thing I got going for me to make you think I'm smart. But you can see how many pages are represented up here on this piano. My guess is, as I have studied, as I have read through these things, 
I have found of not even, I will say it's less than 50 pages total between all of those that are up there, 50 pages total that talk about heaven. There's just not a whole lot out there. It's weird. Of course, I can't just point at the books. I can't just part, point at these smart people. In, that, in less than two months, I will have been in ministry for 28 years, doing what I do for 28 years. I have been able to find one youth Bible study where all I talked about was heaven. And I have found a few uh, uh, funeral sermons where I'll, all I talk about is heaven. And that's it. That's it. We just, there's not a whole lot that is out there about heaven. And even what I have studied so far, as I have, as I have read through these, these resources and read through the Bible and, and tried to, try to course out what this series is going to look like, I have already been challenged in a lot of my preconceived notions about what heaven is like. And so I believe that one of, the first, one of the primary things that we need to do, although it sounds, it sounds so small and insignificant, is we just need to learn, like, like what are we going to do when we get into heaven? Are we going to know each other when we get to heaven? What about, what about the angels? Where do they fit into this whole, whole picture? What about, what about you know, those people who have visions of heaven, and they come back and they tell us about it, and they write books and, and make movies about that? What, what about those? What do we do when we get there? What are, what are glorified bodies and what does that mean? We're going to look at every single one of those over the next month. So we're going to do it, first of all, just to learn. Second of all, to give one of the, a second reason that we talk about heaven or should talk about heaven is to give hope. And this should be an obvious one. People who are, people who are grieving over lost loved ones. To give people hope when they are going through hardships. And listen, one of the reasons that the Bible talks about heaven as much as it does is it's talking to people who are really going through the ringer. And he says, listen, just understand there is something much bigger that awaits you. And one day, everything that you're dealing with is going to be made worth it because of heaven. It's also, it also gives us hope in our own mortality. Listen, in case you, in case you don't feel the pressure of it right now, Let's all understand that we're all going to die one day. We're all going to, I don't care how much, I don't care how many vitamins you take, I don't care how many doctors you go to, we're all going to die. Heaven gives us hope in our own mortality. Number three, it is, it, it is the, this study is to motivate us in evangelism. In evangelism. Last week we had a, uh, uh, we had our first meeting for Go, for a, a, a new outreach ministry that we're starting. And we had, we had good, good response. I so appreciate the people who came out. We probably had, if I remember right, counting, we had about 47 people who showed up for that ministry. And we're going to divide up into two teams. And all throughout this year, we're going to be doing as much outreach as we can possibly get done. It's never too late. I mean, you can always come and join us. I'm excited about, about that, about the opportunity to do outreach and to do evangelism. But Heaven is what gives us the impetus, the, the motivation to go and to share. It's not, a, it's not about whether or not we're going to support a particular ministry per se. It's not because it's on a to-do list that God has given to us. It's because heaven awaits. And we go and we share with our loved ones because we know how great it is. It gives us the opportunity to focus on global missions because all people should hear the gospel and have the opportunity to go to heaven. Heaven is what gives us our motivation to do evangelism. And, if, and hopefully if, if there's nothing else that spurs you on to do go, that I hope that a study of heaven will do that. Number, number four, and that is to help us grow. Our own sanctification. You know, when you think about heaven, if you really study it and you really read through it, you look at it in your Bible, you read what other people have to say about it, it, it really does a good job of keeping us from sin. There's this phrase that's out there that's uh, been popular for a real long time. It says, uh, uh, life, life is short, play hard. Life is short, play hard. You know, 
I mean, enjoy life while you got it, no doubt. But I think maybe that does a good job of taking, of distracting us from the real point. The real point is eternity is long. That's really what we ought to be thinking about. Yeah, life is short, but that just means eternity is that much longer. And maybe that's where we need to be putting our focus. That's why we store up treasures in heaven. It does a good job of keeping us from sin. Also in the area of sanctification, it does keep us serving. Because as we talk about heaven, we're going to see this idea that Jesus presented to us about rewards. And there are different ideas about rewards, but Jesus definitely spoke of rewards. And we do those as we serve him with a pure heart. And by the way, if you think that sounds selfish, let me just ask you this. Why on earth did Jesus bring it up if it wasn't to motivate us to serve him more? Number next. On the back side, to heal ethnic relations. Listen, folks, and by the way, this is in no particular order, but when we study heaven, and you go through and you read heaven, especially Revelation chapters 4 and 5, and then you get on to the end, it's going to talk about how, how people from every tribe and every tongue and every single nation, they're not going to look like you, they're not going to smell like you, they're not going to act like you, but by golly, we're all going to be in the same place worshiping the same God. And here's what the key is when it comes to ethnic relations. We need to understand that every single one of us possesses the same need for Jesus Christ. I don't care where you're from and I don't care what your background is. I don't care how good you were. I don't care if you grew up in church. You need the same amount of Jesus as the person who grew up and lives to this day on Skid Row. Every last one of us has the same need, and every last one of us has the same answer, and that's Jesus. So when we, when we begin to see it in that light, it begins to change our minds, or it should if we're allowing the Spirit to do His work, it begins to change our minds on how we look at ethnic relations. There's not one race or people or status that is better than another, nor is there one that's worse than another. We all need Jesus, and heaven does a great job of pointing that out. Number next, we are going to study heaven to inspire corporate worship. Look forward to having, to doing what we're doing tonight. I think, I think, Mark, you mentioned last week that we were going to find out what God's favorite hymn is. Did you, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I want to know what Jesus' favorite song is, because I don't, I don't know. So I'm going to come here tonight and find out. I hope you'll be here tonight. I'm glad you're here today. If you're, watching, if you're watching online today, I hope that you can, I hope it's possible for you to make it into a place physically just because there's nothing like being there. It's great, but listen, y'all, this is, this is practice. Wednesday night, they're going to have choir practice, and I hope y'all come because he needs, he, he wants more people to come into choir. You come to choir practice so you can come out here and do the real thing. Listen, this ain't nothing but practice. In fact, on Wednesdays, you're really practicing so that you can practice For the real thing. The real thing is going to happen in heaven. When we see what's going to be taking place in heaven and what we're going to be doing for quite a long time, it makes what we're doing in here all the more important. It is to inspire us in corporate worship. Number next. Oh, some of y'all aren't going to like this because you're thinking I'm going in a weird direction. But to promote environmental stewardship. Now, if you know me, you know I'm not a tree hugger. I'm just not a tree hugger. I don't buy the, uh, the rhetoric or the alarmism that is out there concerning the environment. However, you know what else? I mentioned that heaven was mentioned in the first verse of the Bible and in the second to last book of Revelation. You know what else is mentioned those, both those times? Earth. The Bible also teaches that that earth has, has also fallen from the, has been cursed because of the fall. The Bible also says that the earth is groaning for the redemption that Christ brings. You see, when we talk about heaven, it gives us a new focus on how it is that we treat this earth that God has given to us. And I think we ought to take care of it. I think we ought to be responsible for it. It is subject to us most certainly. 
but it's also something that we hold in stewardship. There's going to be a new earth and there's going to be a new Jerusalem and it's a gift that God has given to us to promote environmental stewardship. Number next, to encourage a strong work ethic. Now, I'm not, I don't want to give away too much of, of a coming message, but there's going to be some way in which we work for the kingdom in eternity and for eternity. You think that the gifts that God has given you and the experience that God has given you and the education that God has given you in particular realms are made just for this life. And some of you are thinking, whoo, I'm retired. Thank God I don't have to ever have to do that again. Nope, that's not how it works. God has been training you in this life to work in the next life. It's coming. So we want to, it, it encourages us to a strong work ethic. It also, next, influences our parenting. It influences our parenting. Let me just give you a, let me give you a personal example, and I'm going to give you a personal struggle of mine, if I can be transparent. Many of you know that my daughter plays, she plays softball, and she plays a lot of softball, and she's at the level now where those softball tournaments, they, they're, they're long. They go through the weekends and all that kind of stuff. And so here I am as pastor, and you know, they got, they got games sometimes on Sundays. They got, sometimes they have certain things going on on Wednesdays. How do, how do you deal with that? How do you handle that? Some people are like, well, no, she's never going to go if it's on a Sunday. Some are like, I don't care, she's going to go anyway. It doesn't matter, we want her to have a scholarship. Now, let me just tell you, a lot of the parents, that's something that I, you know, I'm working through, trying to, uh, me and my wife, we try to, we try to have, a, have, a, have a good balance where that is concerned. But let me just tell you, most of the parents of the ball players, most of the parents, they're just like, if there's a game, we're going to be there. Doesn't matter if it's on Sunday, doesn't, none of that stuff matters. And I went and had a, had a, we, we had, a, had a new team, got a new coach, and I went to the coach early on, back in the fall. We had, uh, had breakfast at Starbucks. And as I was getting ready to talk with him, I was trying to figure out, how am I going to explain this? And here, here's, here's what I'm thinking. Here, here's what happens in the minds of parents. We get so wrapped up in what our kids are doing right here in the right now. And we, we do it because we say we, we want them to enjoy things, we want them to learn life lessons, we want them to get a scholarship. And really, at, when you're getting to the level where we are now, at the age where we are, everything, everything is about a scholarship. You want your kids to go play at the next level and those kinds of things. And I started, and as I was talking with him, I said, you know, here's the problem. We, we position everything and we rearrange everything in our, in our kids' lives so that they can get the scholarship and we have a good 10-year plan for them so that we can launch them off into adulthood. And I'm like, that's a 10-year plan. What about, what about the eternal plan? Do we, do we keep that in mind when we are making these decisions? And obviously there's a lot that goes into it, but, but when we think about heaven and all that is there, it should like reprioritize and reconstruct the way that we parent. And by the way, many of you are not off the hook because it, it, it could also reconstruct how you grandparent and where you're pointing them and the things that you talk to them about. Listen, some of the greatest influence in the lives of kids are grandparents. I remember some of the things that my grandparents told me. I remember their, their and, and of course, and of course, I also remember my reaction at the time. Oh, here she goes again, you know, preaching to me again, you know. But, but boy, now I remember, and now I'm like, yeah, yeah, she was right, she was right. So heaven affects our parenting and our grandparenting as we consider eternity. And then last, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that we do this, that we talk about heaven, is for the glory. Of God is for the glory of God. You may want to write this down if you don't mind taking a few extra notes. God is what makes heaven heaven. Love the streets of gold. Gates of pearl, 
all the singing, the, you know, the saints, and seeing the angels fly, do their thing. God is what makes heaven, heaven. And when we get a glimpse of what heaven is, it magnifies the glory of God for us and for those that we talk to. So, for all these and more, we, we, could, we, we probably should spend a lot more time on heaven than we're going to, but we're going to take at least through the month, at, through, at least through the month of February. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do, and I probably should have, should have had you write something down along these lines, and so if you'll write these four things down, that would be great as well, because here's how I want you to respond to what I'm telling you this morning. Number one, I would have you to read up on heaven. I mean, it doesn't have to be, a, it doesn't have to be anything big, it doesn't have to be a big theological book, it doesn't have to be one of those. It might be a magazine article. I hesitate to say to go look at something online, but if you know the source where it's coming from and you know it's a, a reliable source, a solid source, read up on heaven. Number two, I'm going to ask you to stay tuned in February. Be here. If, if you're watching online, can, well, I'd rather you be here, but if, you, if all you can do is watch online, then watch online. If, if, if you're going to be gone, you're going to be out of town, you can watch it online. You can either watch it live or we, we have all, those, all these messages archived. You can go back and watch them in arrears. Stay tuned in February, February. Number three, invite people to join you. I'm, I'm not asking you to get in a theological argument with anybody. I'm not asking you to show people how much more spiritual you are than they are. I'm not asking you to do anything that is uncomfortable. Hey, will you come with me to church? That's it. If you, I mean, if you're really into it, hey, we'll go eat afterward. Get a meal out of the deal. Invite people to join you. And then number four, even before we get into it next week, I would have you to examine your own salvation. Even if you know everything there is to know about heaven, it doesn't mean that you're going there. The only hope that you have to get to this blessed place that we're talking about is if you know Jesus Christ. And if you've never com uh, uh, confessed your sin before him and asked him to forgive you of those sins, to come into your heart and take control of your life, I encourage you to do that. And when, if you'll do that, even before heaven, even before this study begins, I'm telling you what, it will make all the difference in the world in how you hear and respond to the messages over the next month. Examine your own salvation. And if you need to know more about what it means to, to, to be saved, to ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you, you can come and talk with me. You can, you can contact us here at the church. We'll, be able, we'll, we'll walk you through that. Um, if you need assurance of salvation, you've got questions about sal salvation, any of that stuff, we want, it, we want to encourage you to come and talk with us. In fact, I'll be back here uh, on your way out. You can come by and talk with me and say, hey, Lane, can, can I talk with you sometime this week? I, we'll, we'll set aside heaven and earth in order to be able to talk with you about your salvation. Just pursue that and examine, are you of the faith or are you not? God, we thank you for, uh, for the, the joys of heaven and for the anticipation that there is. And there's a lot that we don't know, even after studying. There's still, it's just going to be a lot that we just don't know. But Lord, what we do know, we long for. And we long for because you're involved in it. We thank you for the, uh, the hope of an eternal place in your presence. And God, may that make all the difference. May that redirect our lives here on this earth. May it affect our choices and our decisions. May it affect how we how we treat people and the conversations that we have. God, just use this time to transform us more into the image of your Son. And Lord, I pray for those who don't have the hope, who don't have the promise of heaven. They might have a thought about it. They might, uh, they might want to be there, but they don't know you. I pray that somehow, in some way, as we open up your word, that your word would speak volumes, that it would bring conviction to those who need it, and that people would be gloriously saved in anticipation of this great eternal home that you have created. In Jesus' name, amen.
I invite you to stand and join with us as we close our service this morning, singing of Jesus Christ. He is our sure and our steady hope. fast to Jesus Christ. You are dismissed.